you actually spend time on yourself and understand who you are, not who you would like to be, not who you would want other people to think you are, but genuinely who you are, you become comfortable with who you are and then you align your style of communication, negotiation, leadership with your personality. That's when you're the best version of yourself in negotiations. That's Mickey Bergman talking about the importance of matching personality to negotiation styles. There isn't a one-shoe-fits-all approach. It's necessary to identify and play to your own unique strengths. Mickey has spent over 15 years in various aspects of strategic diplomacy and coined the term fringe diplomacy to describe the new field he's forging, an innovative discipline exploring the space in international relations just beyond the boundaries of states and governments' capacity and authority. He manages relationships and private diplomacy efforts in North Korea, Cuba, Myanmar, Middle East, Venezuela, and Africa. Nominated for the 2019 Nobel Peace Prize alongside former Governor Bill Richardson, Mickey has led his team at the Richardson Center to facilitate the release of more political prisoners than any other organization. Mickey creates new political capital by leading professional exchange programs to frontier countries such as North Korea, Myanmar, Cuba, Lebanon, and others. Mickey is Vice President and Senior Advisor at the Governor Richardson Center for Global Engagement, was Executive Director for the Global Alliances Program at the Aspen Institute, is a professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, where he teaches about emotional intelligence in international relations, and was consultant to the Clinton Global Initiative. Mickey has published numerous articles, interviews, and opinion pieces in the New York Times, Washington Post, International Herald Tribune, Boston Globe, Foreign Policy Online, and Huffington Post. Mickey's also been featured as a subject matter expert for television interviews on CNN, ABC, CBS, Fox News, Global News, and ABC News Australia. I'm Warren Hoffman, and in this episode of Conflict, Power, and Persuasion, we'll be going deep into the process of negotiating the release of political prisoners. We talk about the difference between political prisoners and hostages, Robert Levinson, the longest held American hostage in history, and the newly created Hostage Recovery Act, the implications of the U.S.'s no-concession policy on hostage-taking, the detainment and negotiation efforts for the release of Otto Warmbier, how Mickey coined the term fringe diplomacy, the role of emotional intelligence in international relations, why you don't want to try to negotiate like Donald Trump or Chris Voss, the negotiation for the release of American journalist Danny Fenster from Myanmar, how the U.S. can improve negotiations with North Korea, how to address power differentials, and much more. This is Conflict, Power, and Persuasion, podcast of the Canadian International Institute of Applied Negotiation. Hi, Mickey. Thanks a lot for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me, Warren. So I provided a short blurb on your professional background in the intro, but in your own words, can you just give an overview of your career path? Uh, yeah, sure. It's 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 one that is a uh, kind of a lot of stumbling into uh, through things. Um, but I uh, I was born and raised in Israel um, uh, and came to the United States. Uh, uh, fun enough, chasing a girl. Um, uh, it was success successful chase. She, she's my wife. Uh, nearly twenty years now. Um, uh, but that's how I ended up here and, and did my uh, my education here. Uh, my undergrad at UCLA and my uh, graduate degree at Georgetown University. Uh, and from there started working uh, initially with the Clinton Global Initiative. That was when it just started um, and had an opportunity um, to actually expand my, my worldview from thinking that I will dedicate my life to the Israeli-Arab conflict and the Middle East stuff um, uh, to understanding that the world is way bigger than that. Um, uh, but also um, uh, got a, a peek and a view into the world of international relations that goes beyond what governments do. Um, and I was lucky enough to, uh, to, to be approached by Governor uh, Bill Richardson, the former governor of New Mexico, back in 2006, due to a random uh, set of events, uh, asking me to join him to a mission uh, on a mission to Sudan. That was at the height of the Darfur conflict um, and the genocide there. And I decided to join him. It was not an easy decision because I didn't know who he was. Um, and considering that, I'm a, a, that I was an Israeli citizen, uh, Sudan at the time was not the greatest idea. 
uh, but I went and we hit it off since. Um, and as soon as we came back, I started working with him for the first five years informally because he was still governor of New Mexico. So all of this type of work that, I, that I've been doing, negotiating the release of uh, political prisoners and hostages uh, has been done uh, pro bono for five years. Um, until he uh, finished his term as governor and we established the Richardson Center uh, with which I've been working um, uh, since. Wonderful. Um, can you explain then some of the projects and well, the negotiations that you're, you're involved with then at the uh, Richardson Center and then may, maybe starting with the, the Sudan, if you would? Yeah, well, let me first I should should probably explain the Richardson Center is a is a a, a non-for-profit, non-government organization. Um, uh, so we we do several things. As the name suggests, we are all for engagement. And typically we engage in countries or with governments that the U.S. has more difficult um, time engaging with, whether it's North Korea, whether it's Myanmar, whether it's Iran, uh, Cuba, Venezuela, uh, a bunch of uh, countries like that. And we do it on, on the humanitarian level, less on the political level. One of the biggest uh, uh, things that we're known for is that we actually work on behalf of families of political prisoners. We work on their behalf, of course, at no cost to them um, in trying to get their loved ones back home. Uh, so with that work, um, uh, I've worked you know, in Sudan. Uh, there are two missions there. The first one one mission was about trying to get a ceasefire, unilateral ceasefire by President Bashir um, against the Darfur rebels in order to allow them to actually politically unite and, and be able to start negotiations. But there was also a journalist uh, from Chicago uh, uh, over there at the time. Uh, so those, those missions, as you can probably, uh, you will tell from this conversation, uh, tend to get mixed a lot. Then uh, when I, we came back from Sudan, uh, there was the case of uh, in Israel, not an American case, but Gilad Shalit, an Israeli soldier that was kidnapped by Hamas in Gaza. Um, and so we were working on behalf of his family. Uh, at that point, we were really mediating between Israel and Hamas and Egypt, um, uh, trying to strike a deal. Five years after he was captured, he was released. Uh, we did a lot of the framing of that back in 2007, 2008. Uh, since then, it's been numerous negotiations. The most famous ones are Otto Wombier from North Korea. Two releases we've done in Iran in the last two years. Uh, and of course, the latest uh, release of American journalist Danny Fenster from uh, Myanmar. Um, but there are ongoing negotiations and ongoing efforts. There are nine Americans currently in Venezuela. There are two Americans in Russia. Uh, there's, there's a lot of cases. Wow. I want to dig into those and um, the, the negotiation process uh, in particular, but maybe we can back up um, and just sort of get an idea. Well, you mentioned the term political prisoner. Can you explain just the politics surrounding these events? To what extent are these instances part of a political agenda? Maybe some background there, if you could. Yeah, so a little bit of background. Uh, in the United States, all the terms were pretty much confused for a really long time. Uh, between political prisoners and hostages, and depending on who holds them, uh, whether it's a, a government entity, then it's a ho uh, when it, whether it's a not a government entity, sorry, then it's a hostage situation. So terror groups, criminal groups, right. that's a hostage situation. If it is a government entity that holds the person, then it's a political imprisonment. Uh, however, what happens when you have a government entity that is holding a person, but that government entity is not recognized by the U.S. government? Um, does it fall as a hostage? Does it fall as a political prisoner? Uh, it was very, very murky. And in 2015, there was a lot of staff work done uh, at the, in the U.S. administration that was towards the end of the Obama administration that established a policy review um, uh, that ended up with with a policy directive, uh, very famous here in the United States, uh, that established two entities in the U.S. government. One is the FBI a Hostage Recovery Fusion Cell. I refer to it as the FBI because it's housed at the FBI, but it really is an interagency uh, entity that has the Department of State, Department of Defense, and the FBI in it, and as, long, uh, as well as others. And they're in charge of the hostage situations. And then at the Department of State, 
a new office was established called SPIHA, the Special Presidential Envoy on Hostage Affairs, who is the most senior individual in an administration responsible uh, for handling all of these uh, cases. Now, you notice that the word hostage is the dominant uh, word in the title, and that is that was and is a challenge because the, when you actually try to engage with the captors, they don't accept that these are hostages. They don't accept that these are political prisoners. From their perspective, they are prisoners. They accuse them of doing something. And sometimes they've been tried, sometimes they, they're pre-trial. Um, uh, but if you come to the to the captors and say, oh yeah, I mean the hostage negotiators, it's like, well, we don't have any hostages. So come back when, uh, uh, you know, with the right person kind of thing. Um, then in, uh, in December of last year, so just at the end of the Trump administration, a, a new law was passed and signed uh, by President Trump called the Levinson Act, named after Bob Levinson, who's um, a, obviously one of the uh, most known long-term serving prisoners in Iran, American in Iran, former FBI contractor. Uh, and that law uh, is right now the dominant one. It actually describes and refers to the term that we use is wrongful detention. So okay. those who are wrongfully detained, and there's categories in that law, about 11 categories, by which the US government can declare whether somebody is wrongfully detained or lawfully detained. If the determination is that the person is wrongfully detained, then the entity in charge of his of efforts to bring that person back is the Special Presidential Envoy on Hostage Affairs. Uh, that's the law. Uh, it's relatively new. We're, we're, we're basically, I guess, a year into that law hmm. being enacted into law, and we still have some gaps and hiccups in the implementation of it. I see. That's uh, very helpful. Now, just to clarify a bit further, these political prisoners, what ex- to what extent is it a, a tactic that's used politically versus a, a, a byproduct of breaking local laws and they're wrongfully detained. Yeah, um, that, that is that is an excellent question. Um, and I wish, as you will notice in this conversation, I wish there were quick answers for everything, mm-hmm. but there aren't. Um, because cases are very different. The most robust study that was done on this uh, was done by Brian Jenkins, who's a, an authority in counterterrorism and hostage affairs in the United States. Uh, with RAND Corporation, he actually has the the most robust data-based research. Uh, And he took the, he researched and and compiled all of the data to try and get um, empirical evidence to see if, are there threads and uh, in terms of the motivation to take prisoners, whether they are successful, whether they get what they want, whether the policy, the American policy of no concessions, very famous, we never negotiate with terrorists, yeah. um, uh, does it work? Um, does it help in preventing more cases or does it not? And a fantastic study that concludes with a lot of ambiguity because the data does not have any indication that, for example, if the US um, negotiates for a release of prisoners, it incentivizes or disincentivizes the taking of others. Um, uh, in other words, no matter what we do, and you compare the US to other countries who don't have that policy, uh, the numbers remain the same. There are episodical or periodical um, hiccups in the numbers when the numbers go up, spike up, uh, and times that they not. But the general rule is that most of these cases, maybe with the exception of Iran in the last decade or so, are um, not targeted necessarily. They are more of an opportunity that takes place. So for example, Otto Wombier in North Korea committed a local crime. He pulled off uh, uh, the wall, a, a political poster. Now in North Korea, that's a crime. He was arrested, he was detained, but it was also not a crime for which you pay for 15 years of hard labor, and as it happened to Otto, with your life. Um, uh, And he was actually released after a very short detention, only to be picked up again when the word came up the chain in North Korea that an American was caught violating Uh, North Korean law. Interesting. So it's a target of opportunity. Uh, 
similarly, or again, every case is very, very different, but in Myanmar with Danny Fenster, the latest uh, case, uh, he was uh, detained at the airport, at the gate, when he was trying to leave the country. He had a permit to leave the country. Mm. Um, he passed the passport control. He passed security. But at the gate, he was picked up. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, the assumption is that the local security chief at the airport realized there is an American journalist in the terminal here, Googled him, saw that he used to work for, for an entity that is now banned, and thought to himself, oh, I'm going to impress my bosses. I'm going to detain the guy. Um, and so the detainment was not, you know, a target of the uh, of the leadership of, of, of Myanmar, of the military in Myanmar, but it was an opportunity for somebody in the lower in the in the in the food I chain, uh, and then it escalated. I see. You mentioned at the start many of these places you're engaging with. It's the ones that the U.S. has difficulty engaging with. With. Can you talk a bit about the concept of fringe diplomacy, which I understand, it, it, did, did you coin that term or is that something? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I did coin that term. Uh, it, it's a funny story because I, I, have, a, I have a good friend who's, uh, uh, who's into branding and he keeps pounding me because this is a <laughs> terrible, terrible brand uh, that you established. But I kind of like it. It came out of, uh, uh, I was sitting with my wife years ago and watched uh, um, on TV, there was a, a, a show on Fox called Fringe. It was about fringe science. Uh, and it suddenly, uh, it dawned on me, it's like, wait a minute, that's what we're doing. We're doing fringe diplomacy. It's kind of mm. questionable. It's on the fringes. Uh, but the concept of fringe diplomacy beyond the, the, the term itself, I like it, but others don't, um, is really the space that goes beyond what um, governments are able to do in international relations. Uh, and, it, and it's based on the assumption that uh, non-government entities, whether it's individuals, whether it's businesses, uh, academics, artists, huge thing, entrepreneurs, musicians, all of us, uh, we share similar goals as our government, hopefully, which is a peaceful, prosperous, and stable world. Yet we have advantage, we have flexibility over our governments in conducting uh, relationships and, and meetings and engagements without the whole choreography of, a, a, of the diplomatic core. Um, and typically when you look at it, um, one of the biggest challenges that I see in, in the way we conduct our diplomacy is that when a diplomat and the person can be the, the most personal person, the people's people mm -hmm. uh, person, when we wear the suit, we wear the, the flag and we have constraints. But as civil society, we don't have that. So we're able to engage even in questionable things. We're not the government. We don't represent the government. And, uh, and that allows us much more flexibility. And hopefully it supplements uh, whatever governments uh, are interested in doing, if their intentions at least are good. And we divide the, the work in fringe diplomacy into two parts. There is engagement and there is intervention. Mm -hmm. And intervention is when, for example, when we bring back a political prisoner, a, a successful negotiation and everybody loves interventions because they're quick, they're tangible, they're sexy. Wolf Blitzer wants to do a, a, a special on you, just like what happened to us with the return of Danny Fenster or, or the negotiations over Otto Wombier. And the truth is that those I, 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 interventions can only be successful because of years of engagement. Because it's very rare that you're able, it's not impossible, but it's very rare that you're able to build trust in a moment of crisis out of nowhere. Uh, because the other side knows exactly why you're coming. Um, and so it's much, much harder. But if you invest over time in, in the engagement and you're not, because you're not doing the engagement only for the sole purpose of having a successful intervention in the future, because you might or might not have that, the engagement itself needs to be good. It needs to be a standalone engagement and it needs to be genuine. Um, and so it typically takes the form of uh, following whatever the local community wants. Um, for example, in Myanmar, since 2011 at the Richardson Center, we have done engagement work in, in Myanmar, uh, anywhere from training of political activists and, and members of parliament through investments in food security and, and water, so humanitarian work. Uh, through their request to bring entrepreneurs 
from the United States to work as they went through the mobile uh, revolution in, the, in, in Myanmar. And we've done that. We, I personally have taken seven different delegations over there over the years. When you respond to what somebody is asking you to do, you actually build genuine trust and relationship with them. Um, and when it comes to a moment when you actually need to ask for a favor, um, uh, you're better off in that position. So that, that's kind of a little bit on the frame of fringe diplomacy and how it works. Mm-hmm. That's that's interesting. You mentioned trust um, and the importance of trust. And you, you teach at uh, Georgetown on primarily on emotional intelligence. Is that correct? That is that that is correct. You know, emotional intelligence and international relations. And let me tell it's a, it's a little bit funny because, um, you know, Governor Richardson, who is my mentor and uh, uh, my boss and the person I work with uh, so much on this, uh, for him, this is a, a talent or a skill or a gift that he has. Hmm. And as so many other people, when we have a gift, a certain gift, we don't intellectualize it. It's natural for us. Um, And so for him, the way he's able to connect and engage with individuals is something natural. So he he likes to make fun of me when I try to intellectualize it and try to explain what it is that is happening. Uh, uh, But for me, it's something that I need to work on. And so I, I dove into it and realized that really at the heart of it, this is about emotional intelligence. And when it comes to international relations, one of the biggest uh, pet peeves that I have is that we train and graduate students on all levels um, uh, in the best institutions to analyze and articulate national interests. Mm -hmm. But national interests are just a part of the game. The human layer, the human interaction is a huge part of it that we don't teach. Right. And so we end up with analysts but not diplomats. Um, and, and the way I look at emotional intelligence, there's there are really um, four planes of it, which, which touch upon everything that I believe is relevant in negotiations. The first one is self-awareness. So you need to be aware of your own personality, your own emotional state, what you bring um, uh, into a conversation. So self-awareness is one. Uh, the second one is the ability to manage yourself. So management of your, your emotional self inside a conversation, inside a negotiation, inside a relationship. The third claim is your ability to be aware of others' emotions inside a conversation with you, on the spot or in advance. Uh, and the fourth claim is being able to use the awareness of the emotional state of others to actually influence them uh, in a conversation and in a relationship. And that is, I know it sounds, it sounds manipulative, but but it actually is not. This is a genuine, um, uh, it, it needs to be a genuine effort in my mind. But if uh, if you actually spend time on yourself and understand who you are, not who you would like to be, not who you would want other people to think you are, but genuinely who you are in terms of the personality, uh, uh, your personality, and you settle with that, you, you kind of, you, you struggle with the data that you have because sometimes we don't like what we see you become comfortable with who you are and then you align your style of communication, negotiation, leadership with your personality. That's when you're the best version of yourself in negotiations. Um, And so that's a big part of it is that that self-reflection and feeling comfortable with yourself and then your ability to actually project that onto others. So understanding not only what the national interest of the North Koreans is, but understanding the individuals you're meeting with in their personal lives, how they see the world, uh, what are the motivations that they have, where they are emotionally in terms of in terms of uh, their career and in, in relation to, to your conversation, and be able to actually uh, find emotional leverage out of that. I know there's a lot of terms here. I, I Let me say that um, even when diplomats meet each other, allies, US and, and Europeans now meeting together, our counterparts want to go beyond the fact that we have mutual interests. They want to know and they want to develop a personal relationship because they want to know that you're not going to turn around when the interests are different at one point and and screw them over. And that requires an ability to open up, get to know them personally, making sure that you're becoming personal friends, not only allies on, on paper. Um, and if, if we want to look at uh, 
just in recent history, we, we there was a big story in Israel, an interview with Donald Trump reflecting on his relationship with Bibi Netanyahu, the former prime minister of Israel. And Donald Trump's approach in that interview, he was cursing uh, uh, Bibi Netanyahu because he congratulated Biden after he won the elections. That has nothing to do with national interest. It has nothing to do with interest whatsoever. It's more of the personal uh, relationship between the two and how uh, you react to it. And actually, the four years of Donald Trump as president proved to us on many cases um, that it's not necessarily about national interest. There's there's so much I'd like to dig into here. Uh, I, I was planning on to get into the uh, negotiation process a bit more, but maybe we could just stick on this just for a bit more. Um it's it's interesting that you feel it's overlooked and you know we find that as well because we train in conflict resolution and soft skills and no matter what the level it it does seem to be overlooked by uh, everyone um but even at this level again now you mentioned something about aligning so understanding yourself and then aligning that with your communication style is, yes is that can can you yes hack happy. that a bit Yes, yeah, so so happy to. So here's the um, uh, first of all, I have to have to. Well, we'll talk about something in, in, when we get to the negotiations. But when it comes to the personality issue, it, one of the tragedies we have when we think about negotiations, and that's not only like you know international relations related. This is this is about you know negotiation with your family, with your with your neighbors, with your boss. Right. And um, uh, the people who are most famous negotiators write fantastic books. Uh, Donald Trump wrote a book. Um, uh, Chris Voss, the, the FBI negotiator, yeah. wrote a book that became a masterclass. It's in everybody's feed on Facebook all the time. Uh, never split the difference. Uh, how to negotiate as if your life depends on it. And these books are really good. And if you follow it to the letter, you can become the best negotiator if you are them. Yeah. But the truth is, we're not them. <laughs> the truth is, we're not them. And one of the biggest tragedies, as I started with this, is, is to say that everybody that believes that a negotiator needs to have a certain personality, yeah. and because they don't have it, they give up. And they figure, out, well, I can't be a good negotiator. And I say that is 100% wrong. Um, uh, because, the, look, myself, I am not a, I'm not a bully. I don't have a poker face. Uh, when I uh, um, when I try to lie and if I try to fake it, like everybody will see it in a second. <laughs> and I learned that about myself. I mean, Governor Richardson likes to make fun of me. He keeps telling me that I'm weak. Governor Richardson has the ability to be a bully when he needs to. He, mm -hmm. he, you know, he can bluff. He can do that. I, I can't. And if I try to fake it, if I try to pretend, everybody will see it. It goes. And it goes down really, really <laughs> quickly and really badly. And so I know that in terms of my personality, I it's clear clearly that I come across as genuine and open. And so I lean into it. Okay. And it means that I cannot be a negotiator like Governor Richardson is or like uh, Donald Trump is, but I'm still very effective at what I do in the way that I do it. And so I like to lead with my vulnerability. Here's a story with this. I went to North Korea. That was with the Otto Wombier uh, negotiations. And in North Korea, uh, interestingly enough, uh, when, when, you, when you start negotiations, you actually don't meet your counterpart for a few days. In my case, it was the vice minister of foreign affairs. Uh, why? Because the vice minister of foreign affairs doesn't have the authority to negotiate with you. He needs to know before he meets with you exactly what you're authorized to negotiate. What are you proposing? Mm -hmm. He needs to send that up to his boss, the leader, who will then tell him what he can tell back to me in a meeting. And that takes a little bit of time. So during those days, um, you get managed or handled by a younger uh, foreign service officer in the North Korea foreign ministry. Uh, whose job is to take you around, to show you monuments, to show you cultural events, to sit in restaurants, to develop a relationship with you, and really to, to get from you the details of everything that you are allowed and authorized to negotiate. And that person, typically, as I said, a young foreign service officer, they need to write that memo, they need to send that up. Now, if their memo is wrong, if what they send up is wrong, 
And then you come to the actual negotiation meeting and you surprise the vice minister of foreign affairs with what you're there to do. The vice minister then will be stuck because he's not authorized to go off the line Mm -hmm. of everything that he was given. And for that young officer, that is not only a a stumbling career path, uh, that has major, major consequences on a personal and security safety levels. Now, because it was not my first visit to North Korea, I knew that. And this was the first time I was leading the negotiations. The governor was not able to come in these negotiations because the North Koreans didn't want him um, uh, to be there. He's recognized and everybody knew exactly what was happening. So it was supposed to stay quiet. And my handler, his name was Kim. And we were driving kind of in the car. He picked me up from the airport. And, you know, after a few minutes of silence, I, I, you know, I looked at him and I said, you know, Kim, I have to tell you, I'm very nervous. I'm very nervous and anxious about this. And he's like, why? And I said, well, this is the first time I'm leading the negotiation, the, the, the delegation here, and I don't have the governor. And if I screw it up, he's going to kill me. Now, I use that word. Obviously, the governor was not he's going to be very upset, mm-hmm. but he's not going to kill me. But I knew what it meant to Kim. And he just looked at me kind of with big eyes and looked to the side. Really? And I said, yeah. So look, Kim, I know you're supposed to, to get information. I'm. If you don't do your job right, then there's no way I can succeed here. So ask me any question. I will tell you exactly what I have to, what I'm here to offer. I'm not going to surprise you because surprising you, I know will not be good for you, but it will definitely not be good for me. And, and by just that simple conversation, and this is not about national interest of North Korea. This is about Kim himself understanding where he's at in that conversation and understanding the way I can project. I'm, I was leaning in with my vulnerability. We, we connected over this. And at that point, Kim and I worked together to make sure that his memo that he's preparing for the negotiations is the most accurate possible because it's in his benefit and in mine, even though we're on the other side, opposing side of the negotiations. That's a, that's a great tip. And uh, I think something everyone needs to hear because <laughs> it, it, it can be overwhelming, especially if you think you don't possess all these certain personality styles that other emphasize are important and, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, we, we could dig in more on that, but let's, let's keep moving to your, uh, negotiation process here. What are you doing typically to prepare for these negotiations? Yeah. So it, uh, considering the conversation up to now, it will come as no surprise that I, um, uh, I focus a lot on the emotional mapping, hmm. um, uh, because I find it again, the national interest, and I have to say, look, I'm not government. Uh, so when I negotiate, when I go into negotiations on behalf of a family uh, uh, to bring a, a wrongful detained individual back home, I do not need to account in my negotiations of the complex bilateral portfolio of issues. Um, uh, I can really isolate it into the issue of prisoners, uh, refining it and defining it as a humanitarian thing, um, uh, even though we know it's a political thing. Um, so I, I do have an easier time than a typical diplomat uh, when it comes to this. But again, looking into the individuals we're going to meet, and not only uh, when I look at an individual, it, it's both the individual situation that they're at in, co- in terms of their title, in terms of their career path, in terms of where they might be, but it's also more of the peoplehood as well. Because it, you know when we when we think about um, uh, uh, some of these countries that we work with, we like to say that they're crazy, that they're irrational. Mm-hmm. And the truth is, uh, I have I have met some irrational people, but most of the people that I work with, especially in places like Iran and North Korea and Cuba and Venezuela, extremely rational individuals. Mm. And a very rational, the, the North Koreans is extremely rational society, except that what goes into their box of, uh, of calculation is different than what goes into ours. And so if you spend time and try to understand how they see the world, and then you understand how the, the input goes in, they can actually, they actually become pretty predictable. 
in terms of what, how they will respond to something you say, how will they respond to an American action or statement? And it, it, let me give you an example of this on the North Koreans because it was stunning to me when I when I talk to American audiences um, and I ask them, you know, oh, what should we do with North Korea? And every two people have three opinions uh, about the policy and what what can and should be done with North Korea. Uh, but then you turn around and you say, can anybody here tell me why do the North Koreans hate us so much? And there's typically an absolute silence. Uh, and and you dig a little bit, and then I like to ask the question, especially of, of American audiences, does anybody know how many Koreans died in the Korean War? Um, it, because one of the things that was astonishing to me when I started working on North Korea was to find out, and that happened to me in Pyongyang when I found out, that four and a half million Koreans died in that war. Now, they don't call it the Korean War, they call it the American War. And that figure, the four and a half million, is not North Koreans, it's North and South Koreans. But from their perspective, it's the same people, it's the same families. And growing up in Israel and being Jewish, I was brought up on the education of the Holocaust. And it computed in my, in my head very quickly when I learned it in Pyongyang, that number, that this happened 10 years after the Holocaust, that war. And most Americans, don't even know that a Korean War happened. And those who know that it happened, think of it as this small war between World War II and Vietnam. But if you think, and I know it, I'm not comparing here the Holocaust to the, to the Korean War, uh, because one was a systemic killing and one was war and very unfortunate, but the sheer number, when you put it in context and you realize that that number, not too long ago, and I know from my experience that when it comes to the Holocaust, that every single family of friends and my own family have lost people in the Holocaust. It's personal, it's immediate. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you, it occurs to you that every North Korean you're speaking with has lost somebody. And that somebody is not a grand grandfather. This is only 70 years ago. This is a father, an uncle, an aunt. So the loss is very personal. And as soon as you understand that, you start understanding the level of mistrust because for me as an Israeli or as a Jew, I had reconciliation with Germany. I have acknowledgement. I have Holocaust Memorial Days, International Day every year. I have Holocaust Memorial, uh, Holocaust Museums in every capital in the, in the world. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm differentiating here, of course, the sources of it, what needs to happen, but it's, the North Koreans never had an acknowledgement of that loss. And an acknowledgement of the loss is an emotional thing. Um, and I tested it when I, when I was there and I met with the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and I told him, look, I, I have to tell you, I'll get into the negotiations and into the conversations about Otto Wombier and remains and all that stuff that we have on our agenda. But I have to tell you that as a Jew, um, I know now what level of mistrust you have with me and with the American people. And I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, and, and as soon as I said that, the tone of the meeting changed. It didn't change the interest. It didn't change the, 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 the hard issues that we were negotiating over, but it changed the tone and it changed the level of, uh, of acceptance and, and, and openness to actually hear ideas um, and work together on something. And I, I do think that that acknowledgement is probably one of the biggest obstacles I know I sound very kind of emotional uh, and uh, driven thing, but I think it's one of the biggest obstacles in our failed negotiations with the North Koreans is that a lack of acknowledgement, not apology, acknowledgement of the loss. Yeah, that seems to be a, a repeating theme in reconciliations is that acknowledgement. It seems to be the key. So yeah, and I would I, I would say that sorry for interrupting, but of course where I come from, Israeli Palestinians. It's a major issue um, and both sides are stubborn and not willing to acknowledge the losses of the other. Uh, but even beyond international relations, if you think about the United States and, and our society right now, um, uh, we're so stuck and, and polar, polarized, we refuse to acknowledge what is the feeling of a loss of each side, mm -hmm. just to open up a space mm -hmm. for conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... 
to recap then your preparation process, you're less focused on the national interests and you're actually shifting to understand the interests of the players, the, the, the people at the table. And, that, and that's where you're spending a lot of your time in, in preparations. Is, is that? Yes, that is, that is correct. And that's kind of a little bit unique for us. Not that it cannot be replicated, but it's a little unique for us because when we go in, we're not government. So we really don't have leverage. We need to create leverage out of nothing uh, uh, when we come uh, uh, to this. And, and the best kind of leverage that you can have is emotional one. So if you're able to connect with a leader on an emotional level, I, I know this, this will sound um, weird, but when you need a glass of milk to borrow from your neighbor and you go and you ask for it, your neighbor or your friend will not ask for something in return. They'll give you the glass of milk. Um, and I argue, my thesis, is that is also possible between leaders and international relations. It's hard, but it's possible. Um, uh, it's hard because national interests do play a major role in this. But when it comes to political prisoners, uh, some, sometimes it's possible. And I'll tell you, when we came back with Danny Fenster um, last month, two things. One, we never gave anything in return for Danny Fenster. But more than that, the leader of, of the, um, the commander in chief of the, of the Myanmar military didn't ask for anything in return. The release was based on a, on a bond and a relationship that him and Governor Richardson were able to build in a very short time, but was based on the years of Governor Richardson's involvement in Myanmar before. And so we didn't get, I know everybody, people who can't understand it, can't comprehend the fact that it's possible, then they don't believe that what I'm saying right now is true. Therefore, we must have paid money or we must have made promises. And I'm telling you, not only are we not in a position to make such promises or to pay money or do anything like that, but he hasn't asked for anything. He's actually, um, beyond the things that he's responsible for, that none of it is taken away, he is a very religious man. And here's an anecdote. When he uh, um, decided to release Danny uh, and give him to us, we didn't know what the protocol will be. We thought maybe he's going to parade him and have some media uh, thing and kind of do uh, you know, a, a big splash over this, as everybody, by the way, back home here thought he would do. They thought that he's going to try and get political capital out of it. And when we asked him, he said to the governor, no, that will not be dignified. I will have him wait for you at the airport and I will not say anything until you guys are ready. Um, and again, it's, it, it's, it's not to say it doesn't absolve him and his government for anything that they are responsible for and what is happening in Myanmar since February 1st or before um, when it comes specifically um, uh, to Rakhine State over there. But people are complicated. And, and if you are able to find the humanity in people, they're not doing the things they're doing because they want to be evil and they think they're evil. They think they're right. They have a certain narrative and a, special, a certain way of looking at the world that we can absolutely disagree with, but it doesn't mean we can't work with it and understand and find the, their humanity in it. Okay. I was... Um... I was wondering about that, the power imbalance that you face each and every negotiation. You're coming in as, you know, independent with the family and the, the Richardson Center and, you know, against a, a state. And yeah. it, it, typically there's trade-offs that can be made in negotiations, but you're suggesting that the emotional connection is a source of power for you and uh, creates that leverage is that your main way to address sort of these differentials or each case each case is very different i would argue that this is a common theme um uh, on common thread that that actually uh, threads through all the cases some places it's more uh, dominant in other cases it's not there are other levers that we can do around humanitarian work before otto Wombier in north korea there was kenneth bay uh, another American prisoner, there were many others, but Kenneth Bay was uh, detained in, in North Korea uh, for accusations of him trying to convert North Koreans into Christianity. In one of our visits over there, and that was back in 2010 or 2011, I believe, they took us to a hospital, to a children's hospital, 
when they showed us a lot of uh, children with disabilities. And, you know, none of it is accidental. So we, we came we came out and, and said, you know, maybe we can make a humanitarian contribution. We can find some real, uh, some wheelchairs for children with, um, uh, with disabilities. And of course they, they liked it because they wanted to, to help. And, and Governor Richardson, again, that's, that's kind of the, the, the type of, of, of gift that he has, instinctively looked at me and said, Mickey, we're going to do it. We're going to get them 200 uh, wheelchairs. Uh, you will do it. You will have to figure out all the you know, logistics, the, the sanctions uh, approval, all that stuff. But Mickey, we will raise the money for it. But find me a Christian charity organization that deals with disabilities. Because we are going to give them the money, we're going to help them staff it, but they're the ones going to make the contribution. And the point retroactively, when I stare right now, it seems very clear because if if a Christian charity organization is delivering those wheelchairs and North Koreans are happy to receive them, it makes it awkward for them to hold an American prisoner based on accusations related to Christianity. Mm. Um, and within that that frame, um, uh, two two months later, Kenneth Bay was on his way back home. Um, uh, there was never acknowledgement that that's what happened, uh, but we had those conversations and we raised it. So you create lever uh, leverage uh, when when you can. And I have to say, just to be honest with the listeners, to we're not. Um, it's not like a magic wand that we wave. Oh, ask Richardson, and we're going to go in and we're going to release your loved one. Sometimes. We're able to do it ourselves, like what happened in, in, in Myanmar and in other cases. And sometimes we can't because what is needed in return for the release of an American is a concession on behalf of the U.S. government. Now, I say concession very carefully, not a policy concession because the U.S. government will not do that. But maybe there is a prisoner uh, in the United States that needs to be released as a result of that. And everybody cringes. When we talk about that, because here we are releasing a guilty person in return for an innocent person. I understand that calculation, but still, at the end of the day, when you think about it from a family perspective, if it's doable, it's a price worth paying because you're getting your person back. That In those cases, like the case was with in Iran, with Chiu Wang, who was a Princeton student um, uh, who was caught in, in Tehran and sentenced for 10 years, and we engage with the Iranians on this. Um, and the Iranians, for example, from in terms of their culture and their preference, they want to feel like they're equals at the table. Uh, so symmetry is extremely important to them. Uh, and so in, if we're asking them to release an academic, we needed to find an academic in the US, an Iranian academic that is in trouble legally and needs to find a way out. And so we found that. That was a, an Iranian professor who was on detained in the United States in Atlanta uh, his name is Suleimani for visa violation. So again, not a hard crime, but a visa violation. Uh, and that's kind of when we locked in with the Iran and said, okay, let's let's do that. But again, nobody wanted to do an exchange of prisoners on the tarmac because nobody wants to get into the habit of that. So we had to, to design it. And that's where we come uh, effective as a non-government. We are the guarantors of it. We have the good offices. We'll release one. It will be a humanitarian gesture. And it will be reciprocated two days later in another humanitarian gesture. So there's ways to massage it uh, that way. And we worked very hard. I, I can tell you that equal, equally hard to negotiations with the Iranians were the negotiations with the U.S. government to, to do it. Uh, and in that format, our role was really to be able to isolate the issue with the captors, come up with a proposal of what it would take in order to solve the problem, and then present it to the U.S. government and say, look, it's, it's your decision whether you want to do it or not. We think it's worthwhile because you're, you're saving an American life uh, in this. Uh, but that's something that, is, uh, that also happens a lot. Uh, uh, and again, I'll just one last sentence on this, because, for example, if you think about the Americans who are currently in Russia, for the U.S. government to engage with the Russian government over the prisoners, Everything else in the bilateral relations gets into the conversation. Nuclear, Ukraine, right. uh, 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 Crimea, everything goes in. It goes into this. And that makes it almost impossible to solve the issue. But if we come into it and we're on behalf of the families and we're saying, hey, this is, 
we don't we we we're not the government we can't offer policy concessions but let's talk about it from a humanitarian perspective we can actually isolate the conversation and develop it and bring it enough to a decision that can be made whether this is worthwhile or not yeah that's interesting all those other itch issues naturally come onto the table if the U.S. government's there negotiating. So that's a, a way around that. So the U.S. government must be fairly supportive over the years of, uh, or, or is that maybe a, a stretch? To... Uh, that is, that is, a, that is a, a stretch. It depends on which administration and depends on, 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 on what case. Um, uh, the U.S. government generally is uh, making some general uh, statements here. Very supportive of any effort to bring back an American. The U.S. government is also very fearful because we don't work for them that we might end up in a situation in which what is asked in return for an American is something that they're not willing to give, and that might trap the American for a while right. and entrench the situation. Now that's not how we work um, uh, because we're not, you know, we're not a bunch of cowboys in this. But there, there's not always that level of trust. Um, between the the government and us again because they don't control us um uh, so it's it's kind of limited in in the years of the trump administration it was tough because bipartisanship was not a value uh but it was something to stay away from so for example in, in everything i told you about the negotiations in iran uh, we came up with it we negotiated it we presented it to the to the trump administration uh, the white house really liked it and wanted it Uh, because that was kind of something that Donald Trump felt very passionate about. But his own Department of Justice was against it for their own reasons that had to do with independence of the judicial and all that stuff. Uh, and we managed to negotiate between them and come up with a solution that satisfied the Department of Justice and, uh, and was good with, uh, with the White House. But then the State Department really didn't want us to do it. They wanted themselves to do it. So uh, a few days before the execution of the exchange, They basically reached out to the Iranians through the Swiss and said, hey, 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 don't do it with Richardson. We will do it ourselves. And they undermined everything that we did, but executed the same deal, basically. Um, uh, so, you know, to say that that was antagonistic, yes, it was antagonistic. Uh, but I also have to say, in, in the, in, with, the, with the turn of the administrations right now, the people in the administration, some of them just because of my background, um, good friends, really, really good people, very competent, um, very dedicated, but sometimes we don't see eye to eye. Uh, their assessment of uh, the situation of Danny Fenster in Myanmar was not aligned with our assessment. Uh, we thought they, they had it wrong and we put it to the test and they were not very happy with us doing this, even though I'm, I'm hoping they're very happy with the results. Uh, but it's 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 a complicated relationship. It's I often like to say that that negotiations with our own government is as uh, complicated, if not more, than it is with the captors at times. Yes, lots of politics to navigate. I assume at the table too, negotiating with the captors, even though it's not the U.S. government at the table, the state-to-state -state relations are ever present, sort of hanging over the talks somewhat. Do you purposely make any efforts for the captures to save face, so to avoid possible power struggles? Yeah, well, in, in a way, I would say, uh, well, a couple of things. I think, first of all, yes, there's, there's the, there is a saving face element of it, and, and they need to be, one of, the, one of the biggest problems we have traditionally with negotiations is that the person who's negotiating is so happy with their success that they want to show the world uh, that the other side lost. That's the worst thing you can do. Um, uh, even if you really milk them for everything, for what they're worth, uh, you want them to feel good at the end of the negotiations um, uh, because otherwise the, the next round, they're just not yeah. going to be there for you. Um, uh, so so that's, that's something that is, uh, 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 that is important. But I, I, I would say that... Um, The first thing for us when we when we deal with a captor is trying to uh, get the captor to recognize that they are better served with this issue resolved than keeping the American. Um, and, and there's many ways to talk through this. And, um, you know, in some cases they want to they need to get some domestic um, wins for it, for their own politics. And so they go in and they, you know, and, and they try 
and they sentence and then, yeah, we convicted and that person, that was justified and all that. And that's great. And then you tell them, look, okay, you got everything you, you could from this domestically. It doesn't go up from here for you on this, but it can go down because you can start getting pressure and you can start getting sanctions. You can get people starting to get really upset over this. Here's an opportunity for you to actually gain even more than what you did domestically. If you now become the humanitarian uh, leader that releases beyond the fact that the person was convicted, you're just now letting them go for humanitarian reasons or as a gesture of goodwill. So convincing the person that there's more added value, the captor, more added value for them by not holding the, the person. Once they pass that, that point, then it's just a matter of being creative about the technical way of doing it so they save face or that they maximize their, in their eyes, uh, uh, the returns of this. But that first part is really, really difficult to do. And sometimes uh, in the best scenarios, when we have good relationship with the administration, we're able to play off um, with each other a little bit. And uh, because the, again, there's in all in every argument, not only in international relations and hostage, but in every, every issue you see politically, they're the advocates and they're the pragmatists. And the advocates never compromise on anything. They just keep pushing the envelope more and more and more. They keep moving the goalposts more and more and more. And the pragmatists, typically, if they're good, they use the advocates and, and, and try to move the needle just a little bit, saying, hey, I, I need to answer to those people. They're, they're, they're killing me, you know, uh, publicly criticizing me for talking to you. So just give me a little bit on that. So that's kind of the dynamic between the advocates and the pragmatists. And the truth is, that the advocates need the pragmatists because otherwise nothing will ever move on the ground. And the pragmatists really need the advocates because that's a leverage that they can use. Uh, but in reality, the advocates and the pragmatists tend to go at each other. Uh, for, so for example, in Myanmar, the advocates uh, for the democracy movement in Myanmar, they're criticizing us for engaging with the, uh, with the military uh, uh, government in Myanmar. That's okay for them to criticize us, but I try to remind and talk to them and because we, we talked to them before we went to explain to them our intentions and say, look, you can criticize that. Actually, it works for us pretty well, but make sure you remember what your issue is. Don't turn it into, oh, let's, let's go after these guys, the pragmatists, just because we can actually attack them. Uh, so there's a level of maturity that needs to happen. And that is outside of government entities, that is inside government entities, and the more we have that confidence and trust, again, it's the same thing between, between enemies and in our own government, the more we're able to move things forward. That's interesting. I've never heard it put that way, the dynamics between advocates and pragmatists. And back to what you said about getting the captures to understand that it's in their best interest to release the American there's more to lose if they don't. So you're framing not releasing the prisoner as a loss, then the importance of making that shift to problem solving, to deciding on the uh, the plan of action of how to release is, is the hardest. We talk about that in our training and see it in mediations as well, the uh, Rubicon model and how there's a pre-decisional stage deciding on the goals often feeling out the other party and deciding to work towards reaching an agreement, then a mind shift occurs where it's goal-oriented behavior. So the decision has been made to reach the goal. And in this case, how to uh, release the prisoner. So two very distinct and well-documented mindsets there. Uh, that's interesting. Um, any other general negotiation tips. I think we've established these apply across the board from the family to the diplomatic level here. Anything at all you'd yeah, like to well, share? I, I, well, a couple of things. First of all, when it comes to the families and people don't always recognize that, and that's a, a big part of my work. I engage with the families and I spend time with them. And that is extremely emotionally draining um, because when you meet with a family, when you talk to a family, first of all, you, you, you can't meet for less than an hour. Um, and you assume so much of their pain and the stories are heartbreaking. These are, in most cases, these are families who this fell on them out of nowhere. I mean, the, the warm beers, uh, Fred and Cindy, like they suddenly they get a phone call about their son being arrested. Like they, it was never part of their lives. 
and suddenly it happens and they are forced, they don't have full information, they have very partial information and a lot of time misinformation and they are requested and asked to meet, to make decisions based on that very partial and flawed information and every single decision they need to make, they're afraid might either uh, cost their loved ones their lives or years or months in prison and every decision they avoid might be the one that could have brought them back home. So they are in an impossible situation and uh, I cannot master enough arrogance to talk to a family and tell them for certainty that what I'm telling them is the right thing to do. Uh, so you have to acknowledge their situation, where they're at with all of this. And most of the times um, when we speak to families, it's about, look, there's a lot of things that can happen. There's a lot of options to go about. And um, we are one of those options. When you talk with us, don't, don't stop talking to everybody else because we never know what might work. And you have to kind of allow them the space to make, to make those decisions because the truth is we don't always know what will work and what will not work and what might back, backfire. We pride ourselves that, we're, that we have enough experience in it to know a little bit more than others, but still we, we don't show up and tell them, oh, yeah, this is what you need to do and don't talk to this person or don't talk to this person. They come to us for advice. We give them that advice, but that's, but that's something that is um, very important to understand. Those, those families are an impossible situation and sometimes it lasts for years. And it's extremely uh, painful. Terrible. Now, your question on the on the on the on the tips, I, I, we touched on most of them, but I'll just summarize them because these are my my first my, my my three tips on negotiations and a statement to begin with. First of all, the statement when we think about negotiations, and that is true not only in international relations, it's true to every single thing in your job and your and your family with your kids. Kids are fantastic <laughs> negotiators, by the way. Every parent knows that. I have an eight year old; she manipulates the hell out of me. <laughs> Um, the first one, we need to stop thinking of negotiations as purely transactional, as a zero sum. Uh, negotiations, the way I look at them, is your ability to influence a decision made by somebody else. And that's just one, just to, to make sure we, we understand that. So it's not only, sometimes, look, when you buy a car, it's a zero sum game. It's, you know, whatever the price is, and yes, you can expand and be creative, but that's what it is. My personality does not lend itself very well for zero-sum game negotiations. So if we are going to uh, trade in our car, I'm not allowed in the, in the dealership. My wife does it um, because she can do it. And sometimes the agent will call me, hey, Mickey, can you come in? It's like, nope, not allowed <laughs> because I know what I'm good at and what I'm not. And so really think of negotiations as, as an ability to influence somebody else's decision. And then for the tips, the first one, and the most important one is align your negotiation style with your genuine personality. And that means that you need to figure out what your personality is, uh, come to terms with it, embrace it, lean into it, um, and then negotiate with that. You will find yourself in a way better position than when you try to fake it and not, uh, and not align with your personality. So that's number one. The second one is really spending time in the shoes of the of the person you're negotiating with that's the part of the emotional intelligence on understanding them not only about what the topic of the negotiation is but really where they're at so if it's a job negotiations for example you want to who are you talking with in hr what are they allowed to do what are they not allowed to do you know like just come to come to terms with what they, who they are what they are, how they see it from their perspective uh, because it will really, really help you understand, therefore get, get to the to reasonable and what is possible in the negotiations. Um, and the last one, and we touched about it a little bit, but it's always, always, always know that there's another round of the game. So it's never a one-time game. There's always a repeat of this. So even when you're starting a new job and you're negotiating for your salary, people think, oh, this is it. I'm going to squeeze the hell out of them and get my get salary. Yeah, and if you do that and they feel like you mock them, next year when it's time for your raise, guess who's going to have the upper hand? Just remember, it's there's always a next a next uh, round of this, and that is true in international relations. Don't try, don't burn people. Uh, be genuine. Keep it going uh, because you never know when it comes back to you. So those three things: align your your style of uh, to your personality spend time on, on thinking emotionally about where the other side is and three 
always remember that it's a repeat game. Those are wonderful tips. And uh, yeah, the last one is a, a simple heuristic for ethics, right? Just a principle of how you remain ethical is consider the long game that there's going to be more and how you act now is going <laughs> to can influence down the road. Before you leave, can you give an idea of the current state of political prisoners? Um, how, how many are there? Uh, and perhaps what what the public can do, if anything? Um, yeah, so uh, we, are, we are actually in a peak time right now. Um, uh, there's over 60 uh, hostage and political prisoners, Americans. American, uh, yeah. Recognized <laughs> Americans. There are hundreds uh, that are international as well. Uh, we, by the way, don't only work on behalf of Americans. We work uh, on behalf of, of anybody, uh, depending on the family approaching us. It just happens to be that Americans come to us more because we're known here and not, not necessarily around the world. Uh, but the number peaked also because of the hostages in Haiti, which is 17 at the time. So that's that's a big bump on the, on the number. Here's the thing. It comes up and down. Uh, it goes up and down, uh, again, based on opportunity. There are some repeated violators or captors, uh, such as Iran, such as Venezuela, uh, such as North Korea, even though in North Korea currently there isn't any. From a government perspective, there's three big pillars that need to be addressed. One is bringing back those who are taken. Two is taking care of the families during this whole ordeal. And three is finding ways to disincentivize the taking of more Americans. And on the first, we, there are periods when we do better than, than, uh, uh, and, and periods we do worse. So bringing back people, I know that uh, President Trump loudly, oh, I'm, I've worked so much on it. Truth is numbers, he didn't bring back more Americans than Obama did. He just made big photo ops out of them. Obama brought in uh, others that nobody even heard of and he didn't make a sound of it. It's a style issue. Uh, but we are indeed in a period when less of them are coming back right now. Uh, but on the disincentivizing part or disincentivizing of taking more Americans, uh, we're not doing well as the US government on this. Uh, I don't think there's been a systemic work for this. And I think there needs there can be more. All of this is to say, look, this is not about scaring people from traveling. I think traveling internationally is really important. I know the pandemic kind of killed that part of us, but hopefully it comes back. The whole point of fringe diplomacy, and I believe it. I look, Airbnb is a fringe diplomacy kind of operation. When you have and you stay into in, in, in the homes of different cultures, there's no better way to have our humanity and, and human race connect better. Yeah, so I'm all for it. Don't be afraid of it. If something happens, and it might happen like anything can happen at any given point in life, um, uh, we're trying to work and establishing a task force in the US Congress, for example. So when families reach out, there'll be a base of knowledge in, the, in, in, in Congress for members who've never dealt with anything like that before to understand how they can communicate with a family, what they can do for a family, and how to navigate both the government and the non-government entities of that. The US government, the executive is working really hard through the uh, special presidential envoy office and having family uh, guidelines. So the information is out there for, for people now way more than it was in the past to very quickly getting into finding ways to get their loved ones uh, back home. And the last thing I will say, not every American that gets in prison around the world is wrongfully detained. Unfortunately, there are a lot of Americans who violate local law in a serious way. And we're not in the business of getting them out of out of prison. But for their families, as you can imagine, there are always political prisoners. And so sifting through that is very, very difficult. It's difficult for us. It's also difficult for our government to do. Uh, so just travel as much as you can. I'm a big believer on that one. Learn the local laws, don't break them. Don't give an opportunity uh, for, for others to take advantage of you. Thank you so much, Mickey. Uh uh, such an interesting uh, field that you're in and um, uh, thank you for your, your hard work there. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thanks for listening. If you want to hear more from international experts digging into a range of topics on conflict, power, and persuasion, subscribe to your favorite podcast app or visit us at cn.org. That's C-I-I-A-N dot O-R-G.